Uh, so I took some pictures from the website. So I guess you're putting a little bit of age on you here, Scott. I guess uh, 2004, 2005 was an off suit. I hear that you're a double Duke. Yeah. Let's, let's go through the list here. Um, you're married to a JMU alum as well. Is that correct? That is. Right now you have two boys. I have two boys and a daughter. Please two boys and a daughter. Okay, I, I didn't hear that. And was your father also in officiating? Yes, high okay. school. Yes, okay, so maybe we'll kind of get into that as well. What sports did he officiate? Uh, he just basketball, but he also was assistant baseball coach at the high school level for over 20 years. Okay, wow, wow. Yeah. Um, I got how I, I have approximately four years, but I think that's a low value. How long have you been with NCAA officiating D1? Since uh, 2011, so okay. almost about, about nine years now. Nine years, okay. And then JMU Athletics Department, I saw that you uh, you joined in 2009, is that correct? Uh, yeah, in certain capacities. So I've been, I've been a full-time member there for 10 years, okay. and then I've been um, like a hourly slash volunteer employee for a little longer than that. Okay. And I'll get into that more when I give my background to you all. Perfect, perfect. And then just to kind of give you a pat on the back here, in 2015, you won the Provost Award of, of Excellence. Yes, it's an That's like one of, advising award. Yeah, it was yeah. Uh, very fortunate. Yeah. yeah, that was like one of the only things I could find on you online. So it was cool to kind of find something <laughs> that I could, you know, throw out. Um, and then we just talked prior to the call, you were the GA for um, member services and adventure kind of for the one term. So yep. um, those were the big things that I kind of want to just start off, introduce yourself. I put the, I put some pictures here as well. And I guess the first question is just, can you tell us a little bit about yourself now? Uh, turn it over to you. I don't want to talk anymore. Yeah, sure. So first of all, thank you very much for having me. It's a huge honor for me to be here with you all thank tonight. You. Um, I really respect UREC and everything it stands for, the culture there. And if I can help you all in any way, um, I'm very blessed to do so. So um, my background, I, I've grown up in Harrisonburg uh, my entire life. My mom is from D.C., went to JMU, uh, also a double Duke. And she decided to stay in Harrisonburg. She met my dad and they got married and they just stayed in the area. So I've grown up around GMU. Um, I'm a, a, like I said, double Duke. I've been here for a long time, working at GMU for 10 years plus, um, and very fortunate. It's a wonderful place to be. Uh, undergrad degrees in kinesi uh, kinesiology, sport management at that time. Um, while in undergrad, I worked at UREC for three years. My sophomore year, I was hired in fitness. Um, my junior year, I became a fitness manager. And my senior year was an op student. And just love the UREC culture. Uh, Eric Nickel does a wonderful job and his staff is creating just a great, positive culture to learn and grow. And I just thrived in that culture and loved it. Um, and that's why I stayed at JMU. Well, the people here are just unbelievable. As you all know, they, they hold doors for you. They say your name. They're very outgoing. I just love JMU. So that's why I decided to stay at JMU. Um, interesting fact about me, I did not referee intramurals at JMU. I played intramurals and didn't get into officiating until after I was both undergrad school. I wish I had started earlier. So you all are at a much more of a head start now than what I was. So if I can help you, I'm happy to do that. Um, right now, like I say I work at JMU in athletics. Referee Division One college basketball and Division Three basketball. Love to play golf. Love to work out. Uh, play with my kids. I also coach t-ball and softball for my kids. Um, you know, it's never a dull moment with three kids and you know running around the house. But but I love it and try to balance the work and and family the best I possibly can. Awesome, awesome. So I've kind of broken. Oops. I kind of broken the questions down into like different sections. And so we'll go through each of like the core questions because we only have an hour. So okay. I'll ask those questions and then we'll circle back if we have time and then just kind of go unordered there. Um, and if anyone has any questions, feel free to, you know, unmute yourself, ask the questions kind of as they come up. It's a conversation the whole time. So it's not like we don't have to structure it based on, um, you know, every question from, you know, first to end. I want to hear your guys' thoughts as well. So if you ever want to interrupt, just, you know, use the annotation, unmute yourself, whatever you want. Um, and then if I ask a question and it builds onto something, again, just feel free to speak up. So the first thing is, is kind of why did you get into officiating? That's the first question to kind of start off. I will just kind of pre preface with the fact that not everyone on the call is an official or wants to be an official. But okay. I think a lot of this comes to, like, how can we, as, a, as you know, intramural employees, you know, 
um, once we get into the job force, kind of sell the skills that we're learning and apply them to different areas. Because I think there's a lot you can gain from being an official and it doesn't have to necessarily just be becoming an official later or getting in a career into, you know, refereeing in some capacity. I, I think what you'll hear from me are the, the skills that make a good referee, also make a good business person or teacher or professional. So it's all a similar core values, in my opinion, that make you great at what you do. It doesn't matter if it's refereeing or a doctor or a teacher or a lawyer or whatever. So it's all similar, um, you know, threads that go through people that, that make them successful, in my opinion. Yeah. yeah. Awesome. Um, and so then now kind of moving on, so how have you adopted to officiating in hostile environments? So I, then one thing I, I wanted to fact check was that you've officiated at Cameron. Is that true? That is true. That's I've pretty cool. a couple of times. Yeah. Okay. That's pretty cool. Yeah. So hostile environments. Um, you know what? I, I read through your questions. And let me go back to one before I get to this one. No one problem. Yeah. Is how do you prepare for a big game? Okay. Yeah. So like a Cameron Indoor Stadium at Duke or wherever. To me, the biggest game I work is the game that I have that night. It could be a high school game. It could be uh, at Duke. It could be at Syracuse. It could be, you know, uh, Rockingham County Men's League. It doesn't matter to me. Whatever game that I have that night, that's my big game. And I don't change anything of what I do, whether I'm at Duke working for Coach K or whether I'm working the, the Rockingham County Men's League or the JMU Intramural. It's all the same mindset. Um, for every game and I, I believe that so I put on the, the same uniform the same way every game no matter what the same pregame routine um, it, it all stays the same as far as working at you know a hostile environment goes um, as you grow as an official um, you basically lean on the things that got you to where you are okay the fundamentals so if you are good at your fundamentals rotations call selection, you can block out the crowd because you're so focused on what you're doing. So you don't even really hear the crowd. I mean, Cameron's loud. I've been <laughs> to Syracuse when they played um, Cornell, which is uh, Jim Beheim's other son, and they had over 20,000 people in the stands, and I had no idea. They announced the attendance with a minute to go in the game. I, could, I thought there was like 3,000 people there, but it was over 20,000 people. So, I mean, you just got to focus and stay focused on what your job is. And, and tune the, the crowd out of it. I was looking up, I saw the one game, the tech game, versus I can never say this name, Chattan Chattanooga, is that how you say it? Chattanooga, yes. Chattanooga, it was like a close game. So I was kind of, I put that as like a example, this game as well, but the Cameron thing kind of, I think speaks for itself. That was kind of one thing that I was like blown away kind of when I heard that. So you've obviously had interactions with Coach K, this as a side, that's kind of something I want to talk to you about another time, I think. Okay. okay. Um, Perfect. So in terms of, this is from Mr. Combs, Aaron Combs. I spoke with him to see like what questions I could ask, you know, you, I talked talk to Bob Wilson about it. And in terms of how do you train officials to use their whistle effectively? I think a lot of the times, like Mr. Combs says, like, you know, you train officials to kind of see a play and then act on it. But how do you kind of go about, you know, instilling confidence in officials and, and just kind of people in general? It definitely takes, um, it's a progression involved as far as how you develop as an official. I think when you look at a brand new official and you hear them blow the whistle, they're not as believable as someone who's been around for you know, 10 or, or more years in the way they blow the whistle and their mechanics and how they look and how they sound. So the more you do it, the better you get at it. If you're trying to become a referee, what helped me a lot was getting in front of a mirror, honestly. Mm. Like my signals when I first started were terrible. And so was my whistle. And so I had to practice those things. Like everything else, you get good at you have to practice it officiating is no different yeah. so i had to get in front of a mirror and practice every signal over and over again until i liked or at least could put up with what i saw in the mirror and i basically picked a couple of guys that i saw on tv every night that i i knew that lived close by me where i could call them and i watched them and they're at a high level so if i knew if i wanted to get to that level i'd do what they did so I basically emulated kind of what they did, their movements, their, their reporting patterns, you know, and just kind of pick their brain a little bit because I'm trying to get to that level, right? So I'm trying to do what they did. And so for me, getting to a high level, you have to have a mentor and that's so important. I'm sure you would get to that in a little bit, but that has helped me tremendously. Um, but 
fundamentals are so huge in, in everything you do, not just refereeing, but just having, you know, in, in a job, you know, showing up one time, communication skills, um, the little things make a big difference in life and your job. And the same is true as in officiating. It's all, it's all the same stuff. I think we'll just, we'll touch on that really quick because I think it comes a little later, but I think you brought it up. And again, this is a conversation for everyone that's, that's here listening. You, you want to speak up, feel free, feel free, not necessary, but feel free. Um, in terms of like selecting a mentor and finding a mentor, that's something that personally I can speak to having difficulty with. Um, how have you gone about like finding a mentor? Was, did your mentor kind of find you? How did you go about that process? I have been very, very lucky in my career. So I have grown up in this area. And there's another division one referee and his name is Tim Comer who lives 30 minutes from me. And when I was first starting out, he took me to a division three scrimmage and let me work that game. Didn't get paid. It was, you know, that was at that time, my biggest game of my career was at division three scrimmage with him. And so he allowed me to work, give me feedback. Um, so I've known him in the area for years. My biggest break came, I didn't realize it. Um, my sister played AAU basketball in high school for a, name, a man named George Tolliver, who was at that time an NBA referee, lived right here in Harrisonburg. And so I would go to her practices and sit in the stand and watch. And one day he pointed at me and said, hey, get out of here. I need you to referee the scrimmage. And I'm like, like me? I, I had no idea what I was doing. So he handed me his whistle and I just went out there and did the best I could. I had played the game, but never refereed before ever at that time. And so I was super nervous. And he said, hey, I've got this camp at JMU where, you know, guys pay like 500 bucks to come and get critiqued. He said, if you want to come, I'll get you in for free. I just want to see what you can do. I think you can do something. Mm -hmm. I said, okay, okay I'll, I'll try it. You know, I, so I spent the whole weekend for free with George Tolliver and Tony Brothers, who I had no idea who oh. was at that time. <laughs> But Tony's an NBA finals referee and he's yep. been there for like 20 years. And I, I had no idea who these guys were, none. Wow. And so that was my introduction to refereeing. So how lucky was I? Extremely lucky. Okay, nobody else gets that break. I got that one. Yep. And, and I, I have gotten a ton more, which I'll share with you along the way. But I think in anything you do in life, if you're going to be successful at it, you have to have some breaks along the way. You have to have some people that like you and can push you and open some doors for you. You just got ready to step through the door when it opens for you. It might open for a, a minute or a day, and then it closes again. So when it opens, you got ready to be jumped through it and be ready to handle your business. Or if you don't, you know, you won't get the opportunity again. So you just got to be ready for your shot when it comes. because it, it will come. I can promise you that. Yeah. yeah. Especially now with everything going on in the world, I think that's kind of so important because, you know, things are coming up in different – in different areas and sometimes we're all kind of adapting so uh, i think that's yeah. a really good piece of advice for everyone um one thing i was gonna ask is like i was watching a i was listening to a podcast on like roger ayers like and these like top level officials were you looking to them from like this area like being a hometown boy in virginia were you kind of like yeah so you know tim comer and roger ayers are my two guys uh they're, they're okay. my mentors are the guys that i can call at any point uh, before a game, after a game, I've worked with those guys and referee with them. Uh, Roger and Tim both at Duke. So that was a lot of fun for me to be with my two mentors at Duke. That was a great so cool. real for yeah. me. Yeah. Um, you know, Roger Ayers is probably by most people's standards, the best referee or one of the top three in the nation every single year. He's, he's unbelievably good. Yeah. Um, and I think what makes him so good is how he communicates to the players and coaches you know, he can miss five straight calls and the coaches won't say a word to him. And I can be on the same game and get all five calls right and they're yelling at me. So Roger can just talk to the coaches and calm them down. And he's been around for so long, they just buy his act. Whereas mm -hmm. someone like me who's relatively new, they don't trust me yet. And that's okay. I've got to, you know, earn my stripes, yeah. you know, no pun intended. But uh, with, with anything you do, it just becomes – the longer you're there, the more you get respect, the more credibility you have. And I, you know, I'm, I'm earning it, but I'm not there yet. You know, Roger's the best of the best, in my opinion. So he's been a great mentor for any of you that are looking for a camp. I saw that question out there. Uh, I just, before I forget it, I'll just tell you there's two camps that I think for young officials that would be awesome to attend. 
One is Roger Ayers and Mike Eads' camp. And I'll get you, Spencer, I'll give you the information when I get it for this. Okay. If you can pass Perfect. it out to Perfect. everybody. That's Perfect. the first camp. The other camp is in Richmond. It's Greg Bennett uh, in the ODAC Division III, um, his basketball camp. And they're both usually in June. And um, when I get the info, I will send it to you. You can give it out to your staff. I'll probably get it, uh, I'm guessing, like, at the round start of the year or something like that, maybe February or so. And they both fill up fast, but I have learned, I was a camper at both of those camps for three or four times. And it was just an incredible experience. I walked into Roger Ayers and Mike Eads camp. I didn't win. I went with Aaron Combs. Our both one of our first camps we ever went to, went together, wow. room together. And Roger and Mike, you know, were there running the show. And Roger was like, you know what? If anybody wants to work any division one scrimmages, let me know and uh, I'll get you hooked up and get you some experience. Well, I worked 14 that year wow. and didn't get paid for any of them. And I went to the colonial uh, camp to try to get in the colonial the following summer. And Roger was like, you know, telling the boss, the colonial, say, hey, that's, that's the guy that worked all those scrimmages for you for free. And so he hired me in the colonial. So a lot of times volunteering can get your name out there and, help you build experience and get you, you know, where you want to be quickly. I know it doesn't pay real well, but for me, it worked at JMU as well. So when I was, I, I told Spencer briefly, as I got on the call tonight, I was, uh, I got an undergrad degree from JMU at 05 and had no idea what I wanted to do. I worked in banking for a year and hated every day of that. It was brutal with the old people and their money. It was not a good environment for me. Okay. Not at all like what UREC is, not even close. And so I came back to JMU and then got my master's degree. While I was getting that master's degree, I was in Godwin one day, walking past the athletic administration suite and just happened to notice it. And I just said, you know what, why don't I just go in here and meet somebody? So I walked right in. The lady that at the at the door at the time was the HR director. She had paperwork on her desk over the top of her head. She was like beyond frazzled. I said, hey, I'm Scott Arbogast, just looking to volunteer. Um, didn't know if I could, could start with you or not. She said, well, to, when can you start? And I said, well, how about this afternoon? So that's mm -hmm. how I got my start at GMU right there, volunteering. I was there for two weeks of volunteering. They said, we're gonna pay you 10 bucks an hour. I said, well, great, I wouldn't even, trying to make money at that time. I was trying to get experience, but I'll take both if you want to pay me. Yeah. And so did that for about a year and then volunteered in my office where I currently am in academic advising, running study halls for once a week in the evenings to get experience over there. And then, um, so I graduated with my master's degree in 09. And as it turns out, um, the lady that was in charge of my, my current office at that time called me and said, hey, we have an advisor going on paternity leave uh, or maternity leave, and uh, could, we could use you part time for one semester. We, we can pay you 15 bucks an hour. I said, Well, I, I'll take it. So I worked there for 15 bucks an hour for one semester, did a great job, fit in with the, with the group, and kind of held my own. You know, didn't mess up too bad. And lo and behold, in January, one of the advisors leaves to go to Louisville, and his job comes open, and they hire me. So and I've been there ever since. Yeah. And so for me, volunteering has opened so many doors. Uh, it's crazy. But I know a lot of people in today's society don't want to volunteer. They think it's beneath them. It, it doesn't pay the bills. But in my opinion, that's where if, if you want it bad enough, yeah, that's where you start. And for me, in refereeing, I worked 14 scrimmages that one, that one fall, going to VCU a couple of times, Richmond a couple of times. UVA, JMU, Virginia Tech, you know, I, I put a lot of hours and miles on my car, didn't get a dime for it at that time, but I was investing in myself. And so when you invest in yourself, there's, there should be a reward down the road. And for me, it has paid off. Now, over the last 10 years, I've probably spent $20,000 in going to camps to get my name out there and to build my resume and to get better and better and better. And so that $20,000 was a huge investment at that time, but it's paying off now. And so you, in my opinion for you, for you all is to invest in yourselves because you are the best asset, the biggest one you'll ever have. 
So make yourself the best version of you you can be. And that applies to every job, no matter what career you want to do. If you invest in you, you're making a good choice. I can promise you that. Yeah, and I think it's going back to like making the most of the opportunities that are presented in front of you, right? Like you just, whenever that door was open, you just slid right through and made sure you, uh, you caught it before it closed. The Duke wasn't holding it open for you that time. You made sure to get in there. You snuck into yourself. I love that. Um, this one we got, and I was going to say really quick too, I sent a podcast to the, to the group, I think two weeks ago it was the Roger Ayers podcast on Crown Ref, Crown Ref's podcast. Did you listen? Yep. Did you I saw that? that. Yep. Yeah. And he, he talks about the fact that he had to, you know, go all over Virginia kind of traveling from, he went to Radford and JMU and there was a shout out to JMU in that, in that, uh, special as well, which is kind of cool for, for me to hear as well, listening to it. Um, but he says the same kind of sentiment of the fact that he was kind of grinding, you know, doing whatever he could to kind of get his name out there. So, um, sure. the next, I actually on Roger Ayers really quick, he, and he touched upon it. You mentioned it as well. And I'm something that I have a personal question, uh, is in terms of like the appearance, he text, he talks a lot about like how he looks, you know, his hair, he always makes jokes about his hair. Uh, but can you speak to like the appearance side of, um, officiating, but also in the professional world, like how important appearance is? Yeah, I mean, listen, uh, referees are, I mean, we get judged the minute we walk onto the court, yeah. whether you like it or not. And the reality is that it's in our contract. If we're not physically fit to run and do our job, we get fired. So if you're not in good shape, you don't have a job refereeing basketball. You have to be able to run, okay? And if you're out of shape, the coaches just don't, they don't see you as being credible or being confident or being able to do the job and can't get it done. So I, and Roger is the same way. We both, A, we love the hair gel. Uh, it's important for us, but, um, but on a serious note, you got to look professional. Um, you know, for me, I, I'm almost always clean shaved, clean haircut. Um, when I travel to and from games, I'm in a shirt and tie and a jacket. That's not required. It's business casual for us, but I still, you know, when they're paying us checks that have a comma in them for these big games, yep. in my opinion, I'm going to wear a shirt and tie. And that's just my style. And I just, I think you, the more professional you are, the more opportunities you're going to get. People are going to buy your act. They're going to assume you know what you're talking about and that you're credible. And that's it. At anything you do, um, you know, dress to impress is what I would say. You know, it's, it's better to overdress than underdress. And while appearance shouldn't really matter, uh, the reality is that it does. And I think we all can admit that it does to a degree, whatever that is. Um, as far as officiating goes, we have to be in great shape. I try to work out at least four or five days a week, maybe more than that. Um, when I hit the age of 30, I had to start kind of watching what I ate. I can see a difference in my body. So I'm 37 now. I try to eat healthier, a lot more fruits and vegetables now than what I used to. And I'm, I'm making a conscious effort to really think about what I put in my body. Not only because I want to be healthy, but after I work out or I run and referee a game, I, my body should recover faster if I eat better. Okay, so I'm taking care of my body constantly now. I never before I didn't think about that kind of stuff. Didn't have to. I was young, didn't get sore or injured. I was young. Yeah. But as you get older, you know, those things do change. I can promise you that. And I'm still young by official standards. I'm 37. Yep. The average official in the ACC is probably like 50. So, <laughs> you know, so those guys, they have to take care of their bodies or they won't have a job for very long. So the, the idea behind officiating is to, yeah, it pays well, but you have to make it about a career. And you want to have a long career versus a, a short one, obviously. Yeah. So. And then just, just briefly touch on like the nonverbal cues. Cause I think we just had a tournament the other day, uh, Andrew's on the call as well. And, and Michaela were on the call. We had a tennis tournament yesterday. And I think it's just like all the time we're kind of front facing to, you know, our participants and the fact that you kind of always have to be on that. And I think Roger Ayers talked about on the, on the podcast as well as like, even during timeouts and even during breaks, you got to know, like, there's always a set of eyes on you. Um, just wanted to add that to the officiating as well. If you had any words on that. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, when I'm on the court, you know, from the moment I walk out of the locker room to the moment I, you know, get on the court till I, till I get off the court, um, you know, body language and yeah. posture and eye contact and confidence, it's all uh, going through my mind the entire time. Mm -hmm. So in timeouts, 
Like if you'll see some guys who are not in great shape, they'll be over their hands and their hips kind of hunched over and breathing heavy. And what that tells the coach is this guy's not in great shape. He, if he makes the right call, it's going to be perceived as being wrong because he's not in great shape. He doesn't, you don't buy his act. And so me, I'm always, you know, hands behind my back, chest up, you know, head up, um, looking about what's going on around me. So I'm aware of why they called a timeout, what the time is, what the score is, how many fouls each player have, you know, what issues am I seeing? Uh, are subs coming into the table? If so, why are they coming in the game? How's the game going to change? So, so many things you think about that are just not just about fouls and violations and, and that kind of stuff. Yep. So the, the higher level you get in officiating, the more you have to think about the game within the game, if that makes sense. Definitely. But it all comes back to credibility and, you know, believability with your confidence and your posture and your body language. It all plays a role. And that's true for any job. So if you have a big interview and you walk into there and you give them a, you know, a wimpy hand, handshake and can't look them in the eye, that tells them something right away about you, okay? If you go in there and your shoulders are back and your chest is up and you give them a nice firm handshake and look them in the eye, that also sends a message to them, okay? So that applies to every job. People are always watching you no matter what. In today's society, everybody's got a cell phone and everybody is watching everybody constantly. Yep. So just understand that, all right? Um, one thing I'll put a plug in for you all, you're all very young and I'm sure a lot of you have social media accounts, okay? Um, social media when used the right way is a great thing. But the moment you put something on social media that is not professional or could be perceived as something very, very wrong by somebody, that could haunt you for the rest of your life. It could follow you when you go to apply for a job. And when we hire people in my office, the first thing I do when we narrow that list down to bring them on the campus for interviews is to go on to their Twitter accounts and their Facebook and Instagram. I find them and look and see what they're posting. Because I want to see what they're, what they're about. And, uh, you know, right or wrong, I want to see who we're going to hire, what kind of people we're bringing in here. I want to hire somebody good that I can trust, that I can know that we'll get the job done. And if they're putting crazy stuff on, you know, social media accounts and you know you know what i'm talking about i don't have to go into much detail yep. but it just rubs me the wrong way and they just to me it's a lack of professionalism is what it boils down to yeah and i think at that level of some of these jobs it's like how are you going to set yourself apart you know i was saying this to a student the other day i'll, I'll wink i won't call anyone on this call but i was talking to one of the students on this call as well uh, a couple days ago and we're kind of talking about the op soup interviews and it's at this level, everybody is great. So how are you going to show that you're, you know, different? How are you going to set yourself apart? So, um, no, I appreciate, I appreciate that. I have a question. Our first question from um, one of the staff, and that's from Tom Fondy. He, I don't think he was able to make the call, but he asked, um, how do you handle making a, bad, making a bad call when you know you made the wrong one? And I think this is a question that I would love to hear the answer from, especially from a high-level official like yourself. This is a great question. Um, how do I handle making a bad call? Well, I go into the game realizing that it basically if I make 20 to 25 calls and I may miss one or two, I've had a pretty good game. Okay. okay? My, my goal is to get 90% of my calls correct or better. All right. So I'm, I understand going into the game, I'm probably going to miss one, maybe two. Um, so the, the key is understanding one, nobody's perfect ever. Never been a perfect game referee to, to date and won't be one in the future ever. So I know that perfection is not attainable, but I'm trying to just be excellent, as good as I possibly can out there every game. So if I miss one call and I know it, and the coach says, hey, I think you missed that one, I, I might say, I did miss it. I apologize. I'll work harder. I won't miss it again. You know, I, I'll give him that one. Okay. So A, it brings him, calms him down. It builds credibility because I'm honest with him and told him, hey, I missed the call. My fault. I won't do it again. And for me, I just got to put that behind me quickly and focus on the next call. I can't, I can't focus on what just happened. I've got to focus on what's going to happen. And for a lot of people that don't make it to, to a high level in officiating, it's because they can't redirect their thoughts and focus on what's going to happen. They keep thinking about what just happened. And they miss another call and another one. And then it just snowballs and then you get fired. Okay. So 
That's the reality. You have to have a short-term memory. And that's with anything and you do, any job, where we all make mistakes, have a short, good, short-term memory, and then forget about it and move on. That's one of the questions that I specifically wrote for myself. It was one of the last questions I wrote. And I said, I have a problem personally obsessing over mistakes or, you know, things that I could have done better, you know, how have you been able to kind of leave your faults at the door? And that kind of helps me the fact that, you know, no one's going to get it perfect right on, but kind of the more uh, you do things, the more comfortable you get, the more confident you get and stuff like this, where it's kind of like you're looking for more um, opportunities to kind of grow and develop. Can you just touch on that really quick in terms of like ways that you look for areas to improve on? For me, it's a constant development. I mean, I, I believe if you're standing still, then you're not developing and you're getting worse. Either you're getting better or you're getting worse. There's no staying the same, in my opinion. So as far as a young official goes, uh, reading the rule book. What I know like when I work with Roger Ayers and those veteran guys, they look to the young guys, believe it or not, about rule knowledge. Wow. They should know it. They, they yeah. probably do. But I'm in the rule book constantly. They know that I know the exact verbiage in the rule book. So if we have a rule question, they're coming to me for that answer. Okay, so I've got to be ready for that. So number one is know your rules. Okay, yeah. so know your product. So if you're working for a business, know what you're selling. Okay, know everything about it. That's number one. Um, that, that's probably the biggest thing is just, you know, doing what little things that you can to help the crew be a good partner. So like for me, when I, a young guy on the crew, if I can help like a Roger Ayers, if they're flying into a game, I'll go pick them up. I'll go get them a coffee or whatever. To, and then they'll, they'll take care of me in the game. So I can call my one third of the court. They can call their one third and handle the coaches and the players and make us all look great, okay? So I think teamwork is, is crucial to being good. Um, you know, being the best team out on the floor, us three officials, uh, better, being better than the two teams that are on the court is critical as well. And just communication with each other, which holds true to any, any job you'll have, good communication, uh, good teamwork can take you a long, long way. This actually, that was a perfect segue into our next question. And that's from Andrew. I don't know if Andrew wants to unmute himself and ask it. If not, I'll ask it for him here. Um, I'll give him 10 seconds. And do you want to ask your question? We talked about yesterday in terms of like working with the rotating staff. You don't have to, it's, it's okay, but do you want to ask it? Yeah, I can ask it. Um, so my question was, um, well, first I just want to say like, I'm a little league umpire as well. Okay. So I do that. And a lot of the times, you know, you have like a rotating staff, you don't know, with the same people and stuff like that. So I was wondering, how do you, how do you manage working with a different staff and working with different people when you have to go to different games? Um, I just wanted to ask that. Yeah, that was a great question. I thought Andrew, so thank you. That's a great question. And one that's, you know, it's, I think as a newer referee, when I first started refereeing college basketball, it was very, very hard for me to have new partners from different parts of the country every every night out. So like, it's gotten a lot better in the last, I would say 10 years, but when I first started, like the guys in the North refereed a certain way, and the guys in the South were a certain way, and the guys in the West refereed a certain way. And so we got a coordinator for a national league that got us all on the same page. And so that, that has helped things. But as far as working with people you don't know, I think number one is just being a good person like talking to them, like if, if I'm the crew chief of a game where I don't know my two partners, I'll call them the week before, introduce myself, tell them what my travel plans are, be as accommodating as I possibly can to them. If I can pick them up at the airport, I'll do that. If I can take them to dinner, I'll do that. And you know, they, they will probably return the favor down the road. Okay, so just being a good person and being a good partner can take you and your crew a long, long way. Um, it helps with communication. Like I said, I reach out a, about a week ahead, and then it builds a small rapport. And then when you get there in the locker room for the day of the game, you already feel like you're already on the same page because you've already had certain dialogue and you've talked a little bit um, and gotten past the initial hurdle of just meeting somebody. Okay. And then you just hope that you're all on the same page as far as the calling the games and the rotations and, and that kind of stuff. But the more you do this in this, in this field, the more you kind of get a feel for a certain, you know, for a person, how they referee right away. Like when I'm with a new guy, 
I can tell we can go up and down the court and then I know exactly what to expect from the rest of the game. I can just tell. And, and veterans can see that in young guys as well. But I think, Andrew, to answer your question, just being a great person, communicating, and just going above and beyond to help build that rapport with the older people, um, the older, more professional staff that have been around a while can help with that. Perfect. Thanks, Andrew. I appreciate that. Um, so now I have, I'm going to move into a different section just for time purposes. We're going to go into kind of like UREC and your role as your student employee. Um, so I think this is the first question that I thought would be great for everyone. And is what do you wish you would have known while you were an employee at UREC? You know, I saw that question when you sent it out to me. Um, I don't know that I would change anything because right. honestly, when I, every year at UREC was different for me and I grew every single year. And so if I had known something else, it might have hindered my development at UREC. Okay. So, um, you know, honestly, I think I moved up at UREC into the op soup role because I had the mentality of everything is my job. Like certain people, not at UREC per se, but other people like in different jobs. Um, like right now I'm building a house. And so I have different people come in my house and, and they're doing different jobs. And some might say, well, that's not my job. I do this. Well, I don't have that mentality. If it has to get done, I'll do it. In my current job, um, I went from advising like one team to at one time I had six or seven teams because I kept raising my hand. I'll do this. I'll do this. I'll do this. Okay. So if you want to really grow in your job, don't be afraid to take on responsibility because it will a earn you credibility probably get you a raise at some point down the road, maybe not right away, but at some point it will help you with the, with the monetary factor as well. Um, and it will just build your credibility and respect am among your coworkers. That's awesome. Um, again, another UREC here. And I think this is, again, the, I think these questions, especially for someone like, for me to ask you is, is like gold for anyone listening, but um, what areas do you think students aren't taking advantage of at their time at UREC? And that could be anything from like, talking with the pro staff, you know, talking with their GA, like what are kind of some areas where you think students are kind of not necessarily dropping the ball, but not taking, you know, like you keep talking about taking the most of the opportunities that are presented for you. I think as you rec as a whole puts a lot of trust in the student employees, unlike anywhere else I've ever seen uh, in terms of campus rec. So where are students kind of not really grabbing hold of that? In, in my opinion, from someone who has been there as an undergraduate employee, and a GA, and now I'm on one campus, but you can kind of see it from an outsider's point of view. I think UREC has one of the best, maybe the best professional staff core group of anybody on campus, and maybe in the country. They're just phenomenal at what they do. And so I think from an undergraduate standpoint, if I were you, I would go and pick their brains and talk to them and see how they got to where they are, what advice they would have for you, because when you go to apply for a job, they can help you and be a reference for you. you know, they, yep. can, they can open some doors for you and they're also going to give you knowledge. And they're very free about giving you knowledge and helping you as much as they can. They love to help people. That's why they're like you, just like you, sir. <laughs> well, I, it's the culture that Eric Nicholas built at UREC and I was a part of that, thankfully. And I share the same mindset as him. So I'm happy to help anytime I possibly can. Uh, but I really think if you all want to open doors for yourself, I would go meet the professional staff um, and just just talk, have conversations, ask them questions. I know for me, when I was in grad school at JMU, I kind of did that across campus. Um, I went to meet with, I talked to Eric Nickel. I talked to, at that time, Mark Warner, who was a vice president. I talked to Jeff Bourne, the athletic director, some of the assistant ADs. I met with all of them and ask them, you know, what can I do to get more experience? How can I volunteer? You know, what books should I read? You know, how can I grow as a professional? You know, what advice do you have for me? And they all gave me great advice. You know, Jeff Bourne gave me a whole book list of like 30 books to read, and I read them all, and it was awesome. And Mark Warner was like, just keep doing what you're doing, keep volunteering. I talked, um, you know, with just so many people. And I, I talked to Jeff Poglace, who is the, like the assistant AD to Jeff Bourne, number two in command. And I said, Jeff, I want to volunteer for you. What can I do? He said, wait, is this for class credit? I'm like, no, it's not for class credit. I just want to volunteer. You know, are you sure you're not getting credit for this in any kind of class? I'm like, Jeff, trust me. I'm in, I'm in the health and PE 
masks. I'm not, I'm not gonna get credit for this. I have to student teach. That's how I give my credit, not, not by helping you. And he's like, wow, this is so refreshing to hear someone who just wants to volunteer to get more experience just to come in my office. They don't get that very often. Yeah. So you're gonna impress them right away if you walk in there and say, hey, what can I do to get better? How can I grow? You know, what advice do you have for me? I think you'll be surprised at how much further that would take you in your career and pretty quickly at that. Yeah, I think that's gold. So uh, that's something even I'm going to try to incorporate in my own life. So I think that's definitely something that we can all try to keep pushing ourselves to, you know, do a little bit more while staying kind of, we're going to talk about balance a little later on, but trying to continue to fill our plates as much as we can, um, you know, actually do. So that's actually perfect segue. And I didn't even plan this perfectly, but it's perfect segue into like, how do you go about building relationships with the pro staff? Um, I think I want to touch on specifically undergrad. Like, how did you bridge that gap? And what were some strategies that you can use? Nowadays, it's kind of easy, I guess, to, you know, set up a Zoom call like this, send an email. Um, but sometimes, you know, I know individuals are maybe a little bit shy to talk with the, the pro staff. How do you kind of bridge that gap and build that confidence? Yeah, I'll be honest with you. I was, when I came to GMU, I was super shy. I didn't want to talk to people. I had a hard time going in to talk to especially from office hours, one-on-one, -on -one, it was just hard. Yeah. yeah, I had something I had to get out of my comfort zone and do over and over again. The more you do it, like anything else, the better you get at that. It's a skill. And so, you know, for me, going to talk to people um, really helped to open doors and, um, you know, just, it just made life a lot easier. Um, you know, when you can talk to people, they can give you great advice. You know, you write it down. You can always ask questions. And for me, I'm old school. So I don't like to do a whole lot through email. And I think the older people older than me, when you, people are probably going to hire you for your job, they don't like emails either. They want to see you in person. Okay. I would email to set up an in-person meeting if I were you and go in person, have a notebook, have a pencil, a pen, um, dress business casual or professionally when you go meet with them. It will, I will, it will be amazing for you how fast you will move in your career. You can just do those simple things. Meet somebody in person, look them in the eye, firm handshake, be prepared, have questions already written on your pad, ready to go so you don't, you know, not remember your questions when you have, or they're in the interview or whatever. And um, it will help you tremendously. Okay, people that send emails, they might answer it, but they might give you a, a one sentence or two sentence answer, and it won't be very genuine most of the time. They're just trying to get it done off their plate. But when you're there in front of them in person, they have to at least acknowledge that you're there and focus on you for that amount of time. And typically at JMU, they will give you all they've got for the minute you're in front of them. So in my opinion, I would not be sending emails asking questions. I would be sending an email to ask, when can we meet? I'm available at these days and times. Would any of these suit your schedule? And meet for 30 minutes. That's what I did. It worked great for me. That's awesome. Um, all right, this is, this is a question that's kind of close to home for me. Like we talked about at the beginning, you know, whether it's working intramurals to become an official, you know, whether you want to stay in the field of intramurals, you know, become a graduate assistant, whatever it is you want to do. Um, how do you kind of explain the value of experiences of being an employee at UREC and how did you kind of, when you were applying for jobs, going through the inter interview process, how did you kind of highlight some of the things that you learned at UREC that you felt were, like you said, applicable to any career? I mean, working at UREC for me was just so valuable. I mean, it taught me how to work with people, how to get jobs done as a group, how to, you know, collaboration with people, also how to work, how to work individually as an obviously if I had to go in and unlock all the doors and open everything up and make sure it all got done, um, added responsibility. Uh, and also when you're making your money at UREC, while it might not be, you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars, you're still making some money. You can also plan and, and have a savings account and invest that money so it grows over time. If you're, if you're working at UREC and making money and you're spending it all at the same time on beer and pizza, you're making a mistake. I can promise you that. Okay? Sure, sure. I, I remember this. I'll, I'll say this quick story. When I was a sophomore working at fitness, okay, we got paid a direct deposit into our checking account, whatever, every two weeks or whatever it was. Um, I was living at one campus, didn't have a car in my sophomore year. So I just kept working and working and forgot I was even getting paid. And then I got home for Christmas break. I had like $3,000 in my account. Like, wow, where did this come from? So like, if you don't spend that money, I can promise you when you graduate, 
you'll, you can thank yourself a lot. And you'll be so excited you have that money in the bank account. It might not be a ton of money right, right now, but it will get you so far ahead when you have to get your first apartment or townhouse or car house uh, or buy a car, whatever it might be. It's great just to have that money in the bank. So if you're working at UREC, save some of that money and put it away because you're going to need it. I can promise you that. Yeah. And some of that comes back to sacrifices, kind of making sacrifices, yeah. small sacrifices, right? So, um, so we're getting close with time here. So I'm going to, we're going to go into the next section, which is like self-evaluation, personal development. You kind of talked about the fact that you're, if you're not moving forward, you're kind of moving backwards in a sense. Um, I want to start off a little bit out of order here, but Mr. Bob Golson, when we spoke together, he talks about, and I love this. And he talks about how, you know, one of the first, time I, you know, when I was doing my research, kind of learn about you, the only thing that kind of came up was that Virginia Tech game. Um, and it's just that little name right beside, you know, on the score box, but it's nothing else in terms of like, LeBron James can look at the statue and say, you know, I had eight turnovers today, and I had, you know, only two rebounds, right? Next game, I'm going to focus on rebounding. Next game, I'm going to focus on, you know, containing the ball and not turning it over. Whereas for officials, you know, you just have your name there. So how are you kind of monitoring your own stat line, so to speak, game to game? Well, it's, it's interesting. So every game that I referee, I always watch that game again afterwards. It might not be the next day, but it, within the next four or five days, I watch that game start to finish. And I watch every call that I had. I watch every call that I could have had, the no calls. I watch my body language. I watch my interaction with players and coaches and just, I just watch myself and I critique myself. And for anybody that's any good at whatever you do, taking feedback from yourself is huge. The people that don't advance in their careers, in my opinion, aren't honest with themselves. They can't critique themselves and say, you know what, I could do better at this or this, or I, I didn't do a great job at this, okay? People that say, I'm great, I did great, I got them all right tonight, they're lying to themselves. Yeah. So when you can critique yourself, you can go so much faster in your career. It's, it's amazing, okay? And what I did, I refereed high school basketball for about five or six years until I got to the college level. And I would try to watch as much film as I could of myself at that, at that time. And for me, just constantly watching myself, critiquing myself, making myself better, it really elevated me quickly. And I think in any career you do, if you can critique yourself, um, you're going to go that much faster. I mean, you're going to have bosses that will critique you as well. Definitely. I've got a boss that watches us every game in the ACC in Atlantic 10. He doesn't miss a game. But I don't hear from him maybe once or twice a year when I mess something up. And, that, and that's okay. But I know I'm not perfect in the other 40 games that I work. So I'm watching myself constantly trying to improve my craft at what I do. Uh, I'm a big believer in professional development and working hard and try, always trying to get better. If you're not trying to get better, you're getting worse. And somebody's gonna pass you and take what you think should be yours. And that's, that's my thought process. Like right now I'm on the ACC staff. There's no guarantee that I'm gonna be on that staff next year because there could be some more young guys working harder than I am. And that's my motivation, is to not get caught from behind by somebody else trying to take what I believe is mine. Yeah. So I'm always trying to improve and realizing there's thousands of people that want to do what I do. I'm very fortunate to, to have this job and to work at JMU and make it all kind of fit together. Um, I'm very fortunate to have both careers, but you know, at any certain point, it could be gone as far as basketball goes. You know, it, it, nothing's guaranteed in life. And yep. so that's my motivation to take care of my family and myself um, and take care of everybody and work hard and be the best referee that I can be and be the best Scott Arbogast that I can be every single night. And one of the bigger motivations for me when I referee a game, there's always somebody in that arena that has never seen you before. So I'm trying to give them my very best effort, whether it's in the ACC, the A-10, or Division Three, or like I said, Rockingham County Rec League, which I'm doing tomorrow night. So I'm gonna give the same effort on that court that did when I was at Cameron Indoor Stadium. It does not change for me. It's the same thing night in, night out. And when you hear LeBron James talk or Kobe Bryant in his past interviews, it was the same mentality. It, it is working as hard as you can all the time, constant pushing yourself. Um, there are no rainy days or days off. Mm -hmm. it, it's, it never stops if you want to be the best in your field. Mm -hmm. just, just my opinion. Definitely, definitely. 
and so for us that we can't really necessarily watch film you know on officiating on ourselves officiating let's say obviously you welcome feedback is that something where you would go to like senior officials or you know even on on james campus your superior your, your supervisors etc and kind of welcome that feedback ask for that feedback constantly absolutely so when i worked high school basketball um, we could see, like, I, I was working the JV games. I could see he was following me on the varsity games. I would ask the, the crew chief to come early and watch the second half of our game and critique me either after our game or on the way home, give me a call. And so when you seek out people to help, they're usually going to help you out. Yeah. And so you know, just asking for feedback helped. I also would contact the coaches for the high school games. They would send me the videos uh, and I would watch them. Uh, or I would have my wife come and, and she's a coach at the middle school level. And she knows her stuff. She could watch my game and she could say, hey, I would look at this play or you didn't look like you knew what you were doing at this time. You know, things to always work on. So, yeah. and, um, you know, when you ask for help, usually they're going to help you out, especially on this campus. Yeah. You know, if I'm able to come and watch some, I'm happy. I've done it before. Um, uh, watch some you, you all referee and it's been a, a blast. I love it. I love to help people to pass on the information that Roger airs the world have given to me. Now I can give to you. So I'm happy to do that. That's amazing. Um, so that's actually again, another great segue into how do you evaluate officials when you are watching them? Uh, we kind of touched on a little bit earlier uh, in our discussion, but what are you looking for right away? We talked about appearance right away. What is the first thing you're looking on? Let's say they don't come and shake your hand and, and get the eye contact right away. What are you looking for when you see them on the pitch on whatever field they're on, court, et cetera? I look for the controllable. So like example, appearance, you control your appearance. You can, you control like for the guys, do you shave when you referee, um, you know, girls, do you have your hair in a nice neat ponytail. However you wear your hair is it, is it professional looking? Um, how is your dress? Is your referee shirt wrinkled from the night before? You just ball up, put it in a pile somewhere and just put it on, it's all wrinkled. Um, are your pants ironed? Um, are you hustling? That's a big one for me. Yep. Like in basketball, I see a lot of people call foul. They just walk to the table and then give their signals. And it just looks sloppy to me. Like I want guys that call it nice, quick jog to the table, report their foul and then hustle back. I like to see hustle and so do coaches. Yep. Um, I, look, I listen for the sound of your whistle. So uh, the whistle can, can give you a lot of way about your call. I can tell a lot about how you blow the whistle. Are you confident in your call? Um, how long have you been refereeing? And, and you might say, well, how do I know how long you've been doing it by the sound of your whistle? Well, I know because when I first started, my whistle was not very good, okay? The whistle, the sound has to come from your gut not just the, lung, the air in your lungs, okay? So when I referee, I put the tip of my tongue into the whistle and put my lips around the whistle, and then I, I blow and then take my tongue off, and it's a sharp blast of air versus just like a, you know, a dull whistle sound, mm. okay? And I, I'd have to show you in person to what I mean. Yeah. It's a distinct difference when you hear like Roger Ayers blow the whistle or you hear a, a first year intramural referee blow the whistle, they don't sound anywhere close to the same, okay? Mm -hmm. So little things like that, I, I just look for how they handle themselves. Uh, can they talk to players? In my opinion, if you can referee intramural basketball at GMU, you can referee anywhere in the country at any level. It doesn't get any harder than dealing with some of those head cases, uh, some of the frat guys, I've been there, <laughs> okay? So uh, if you can deal with them, and those. control those teams, you can control anybody on earth. It, yep. It'll make Duke look easy. I can promise you that. And that comes back to like personability and being able to communicate, right? I think that's a big sure. thing I've taken from your, uh, your time with us is communication is so important. Yeah, and the ability to diffuse situations is even more important. Like when players come at you as they do in intramurals, they, they don't think that you know what you're doing, A, because you're getting paid like 10 bucks a game or whatever it is now. Um, yeah. they're, they're aware, they, they don't think you're good enough because they are, they're, they're LeBron James. They're going to be in the NBA next year. Just ask them, okay? So they don't think you know what you're doing. So if you can, can, can diffuse them and redirect them and just kind of get them to focus on something else, um, it'll make your game go a whole lot better for you, okay? So if the player's coming at you and they're yelling at you and, and just say, hey, just, just talk. I'll answer your question. You know, if, if, 
If I missed a call, I apologize, but what did you see? And ask them a question back and get them to dialogue with you a little bit. You can't talk the whole game to them. Yeah. But you know, during a timeout or something, um, when they need some water, um, talk to them. You know, the same for coaches. So you work high school basketball, you intramural, whatever, or you all have tournaments, club tournaments. Talk to the coaches. You know, go over there and have some dialogue during timeouts, and it will help your games go amazingly better. And I learned that through doing just that. So when I first got to college, I didn't want to talk to the coaches at all. I didn't want to talk to the players. All. I just wanted to referee. And that was okay, but it didn't allow me to excel. And I wasn't getting good feedback from the coaches because I wasn't approachable. Mm -hmm. I didn't seek them out. So the more approachable you are, the better your games are going to go and the higher you're going to move up. And it comes back to the whole thing about building relationships. And it's yes. not always what you know, but who you know, right? So if you can build these relationships on the way, um, I think it'll help. It helps you. I mean, you can kind of attest to that from based Absolutely. on what you talked about. Absolutely. Yeah. And I think on the Roger Ayers podcast, he talks about how like the relationships he's built with coaches, you know, he's like, I got you, you know, I'm your guy, you know, talk with me, let me know if, you know, things are going wrong. That's kind of what they want to hear as well. The, the communication aspect. Um, I want to open it up because I just got a couple of minutes left of your time. I want to open it up to anyone on the call. If anyone has any questions or anyone wants to say anything, or I'll try to leave uh, Scott here with a couple questions to get him out of here. But does anyone have anything that they want to just throw out? So it's not just me. It can be anything. Anything, exactly. What was it like coaching uh, refing at Cameron? Yeah, great question. Love that, James. <laughs> well, I'll say this. The first time I was there, I got there about like four hours prior to the game. I was nervous, obviously. Yeah. And four hours prior at most gyms, there's nobody in sight. Four hours prior at Duke, lines wrapped around the arena to get in. Wow. I was like, wow, this is unbelievable. So, you know, I, I, uh, I got in there uh, well before tip-off, like two hours prior. And um, at Duke, you have to walk through the crowd to get to your locker room. They have, like, police escorts and everything. It was just, it's just surreal. It's just a different atmosphere there, as you all have seen on TV. Or if you've been there, you've, you've experienced it. Uh, but from the time the ball goes up until the final buzzer, those fans, they don't sit down. They're yelling and screaming. It's, it's awesome. I love it. Uh, great energy. It keeps you on your toes. Um, you know, Coach K is one of the best coaches ever. He's a Hall of Famer, obviously. Uh, extremely, extremely bright coach. Um, and he's, he's won, what, five titles for a reason. He's, he's, he's got it right here. Yeah. And so as far as the referee goes, on our crew, if we make a call, it's not in our area. He might be sitting there nice and calm, and all of a sudden he just jumps up because he knows he's been around so long he knows something just happened that wasn't quite the way it should be. You know, he's not a referee, but he's been around the game so long, he just knows. He has that great feel for the game. Mm -hmm. So it's just interesting to be around coaches at that level that are so intelligent. You know, Tony Bennett from UVA, another good one. They're yeah. all that way. You know, they're all that intelligent. So you've got to be on your game the entire time, or they're going to seek you out. They're going to know that you, you don't belong there if you, you, know, if you can't handle your business with them. But it, it, was a, it was a great opportunity for me to go there in front of a packed house and referee with you know, two guys I'm close with, Tim Comer and Roger Ayers. And uh, we had a great game. They played the Division II National Champions from the year before and almost lost the game. So, um, you yeah, know, it was, it was a great night. <laughs> Anyone else? I have a fun question I can ask. Okay. Give me like, give me the, and then I have two questions to leave you with. And if that's okay, if we're good for time. Uh, sure. But the, the fun question is like, who was the person that you officiated that was like, I mean, I don't see you getting kind of like starstruck, but you know what I'm saying? Whereas like, a, you know, like a Zion or, you know, like a top level uh, D1 athlete that you thought was like really amazing to referee and, and as a player. I've only been like jaw on the floor twice. Okay. Yeah, players. The first time uh, I was in Las Vegas at a camp and LeBron James walked into the gym. And just wow. to see him walk into the gym, like his shoulders are probably like twice as wide as all about it. He's oh just unbelievably God. big and strong oh and fast and all of those things. Yeah. And I was like, wow, I, I see why he's so good. Just by looking at him, you know? yeah. The second time was being at Duke and refereeing Zion Williamson. Wow. Similar type of athleticism. 
know, he just, you see him jump and like so, some, most guys go up and they come back down. He just goes up and he never comes back down. It's unbelievable. Uh, he just jumps that high. And um, to see him almost hit his head on the rim was like, oh my goodness, I wish I could do that. But uh, it was pretty cool. Yeah, it was wow. pretty cool. That's awesome. That's awesome. I have two. So I'll leave you with these two questions. I think it's kind of a fitting way for us to end. So how do you prepare for games? What's kind of your routine before a game? Because I'm a routine-oriented individual. And I think a lot of people – if they can get into a routine that makes them comfortable when they go to that game, if they're doing the same thing every time, they can be confident knowing that they've kind of checked everything off. Um, and then yeah. the, the second part of it will be kind of like after the game, how do you reflect? So I'll let you kind of leave us with those nuggets. Yeah, sure. So you know, how do I prepare before a game? So let's say I've got a Saturday game somewhere. I always pack my bag. I pack my bag. You know, some guys have their wives pack their bag or, their husbands pack their bag, whatever. I always pack my bag. That way I know what I need is in my bag. Yes, sir. So I make sure I've got socks, shoes, pants, undershirt, jersey, whistle, all the essentials are there to referee the game. Okay. That's the first thing. I make sure double check everything I need is with me. Um, I always make sure that I eat a pregame meal at least two to three hours prior to the game. Because, you know, we're athletes as well, in my opinion. We have to run for 40 minutes up and down the court, change directions, sprint, jog. You know, it takes a lot out of you. So I make sure I get a good meal with carbohydrates and proteins and plenty of fluid the day before and day of games and also after the game. I always get to the game. We have to get there for college an hour and a half prior. I don't cut it close. Uh, some guys are rolling in and hustling in, you know, right at the hour 30 mark. I get there probably two hours before. I don't like to rush. It makes me anxious and, and worrying about things that I don't need to worry about before going in front of like 20,000 people at Syracuse. Yes, sir. And being late, in my opinion, it only causes bad things. It causes you to rush, get out of your habits. It just gets your mind elsewhere where it doesn't need to be. So having a routine will help you stay calm, stay focused on what you have to do. And it will allow you to be at your best. Uh, for me, when the ball goes up, I'm ready to rock and roll and focus on what I can control during the game. Um, and you asked, what was the second part of your question? How do you reflect on the games? That I've been? You talked about watching film, trying to better yourself. But in terms of once the game's over, how do you kind of get out of that zone of that high-intensity, hostile environment and just reflect on, you know, the game and moving forward? Well, as you can imagine, being in some of those environments – um, you're pretty amped up after the game. Sure, yeah. And so as I'm driving home or back to the hotel, wherever I have to go, I'm thinking about the game, what went well, what didn't go well, what I liked, what I didn't like. Uh, I'll go back and I'll look at the plays that I had questions about to see what my thoughts were. If they weren't correct, then I look to see why. Was I out of position? Um, did I reach out of my area or did I just miss it? And most of the time it comes from being out of position, honestly. That, that, causes most of my mistakes is being out of position. Um, I'll think about the game for no more than 24 hours and then I, it's gone. Mm -hmm. I'm going to the next game. So I don't, I don't focus on any game longer than one day. Uh, the moment the next game starts, I'm on that game and not thinking about what happens, about what's going to happen. And so that's just my mentality. That's awesome. Yeah. I'm gonna, let me just, let me just uh, do my share here and start it off. So I'll leave you with this, uh, if I can get this thing all set up here, I'm going to move this guy just so everyone has your info here. Um, oops. Apologize about that. Um, so I think for me, for the team, I just want to thank you for your time, taking the time out of your day, especially on a Sunday. I really appreciate this. Um, there was definitely some things that I can even take from this call, a lot of things that I took from this call, and I want to watch it back another time. So we have the recording. Um, I plan to distribute it out to all of you. Um, thank you all for taking the time Sunday night to, um, to be on the call with us, ask some questions, submit them to me. Mr. Arbogast's uh, email's there. I'm sure he would be okay with you emailing him. I emailed him. That's kind of how we started this communication. Um, and it started, like he talked about, just, you know, reaching out to the post staff. I talked to uh, Bob Golson about him, and then we kind of just went from there. And um, hopefully we can have you in person kind of moving forward with once intramurals get started up again, but I really want to thank you for your time and really appreciate it. Oh, thank you all. The, the pleasure is all mine. I really enjoyed talking to you. 
Uh, if I can do anything to ever help any of you, please let me know. Uh, I work in the Plecker Center right there by the football stadium, so I'm not far from UREC. Um, if you have any questions or concerns or if you just want an honest opinion from somebody outside of UREC, I'm okay with that as well. And it can be basketball or non-basketball. It does not matter to me. If I can help you in any way, I would, I would gladly do so. Perfect. Thank you, sir. Thank you all. Thank you all very much. You have a great night. Thank, Thank you. you.